All right, we're good. So basically the objective of the podcast, uh, at least the video chat version of it is, is really just to get a better understanding of how um, different people from different uh, backgrounds in the real estate space are seeing COVID impact their, their aspect of real estate and, and just applying as many different lenses as possible to the challenges that we're facing. It seems that people have the perspective that, you know, it's, it's our job to work together in, in solving and overcoming these challenges. And so I figured one of the best ways to, to achieve that goal is to gather as much information as possible. And so that seems to be my attempt at a meaning, meaningful contribution. Um, so anyway, th that's sort of the overview of, of what I'm doing. And I was wondering if for those who don't know you, I obviously know you pretty well, but for those who don't, if you could just give a, a little bit of an overview of your, who you are and what you do and yeah. how things have changed for you, I guess, just generally as a result of, of COVID in the past, I don't know, I guess it's been six weeks now, right? Yeah. Um, so start, uh, I'm Brett Llewellyn Thomas and I'm a proud Guelph uh, real estate alumni. And um, I think as you have you talked to before, it was an incredibly uh, strong program to go through and graduate with a network of alumni that we are all now connected, with really good relationships at kind of every facet of the industry from appraisal to development and, and everything, uh, you know, that supports real estate. So I think it's really good, a really good initiative that you're doing. It's been really nice to, to hear some familiar voices and see some familiar names on the uh, agenda to come. Yeah. And, um, and so coming off of that, I'm, uh, I, I started out in the trenches of CBRE in the uh, research department uh, doing the building walks. And um, uh, I think it's an interesting point I wanted to bring up just because we're sitting here at the end of April, uh, which is the time when most graduates would be graduating school and starting in those trenches. And so right. uh, when, I, when I started back in 2012, uh, you know, they give you an assignment to walk some buildings, get an understanding of the layout, get an understanding of the tenants that are there. Um, and it was a really good learning tool. For sure. And so it's going to be interesting to see how people adapt to that because now there's a whole cohort of graduates who won't be able to go through that, at least right now. Yeah. And uh, that's just a, you know, a very obvious impact of everything that's going on. For sure. Um, from CBRE, uh, I worked there uh, as a, in research and in financial analysis, uh, and then I moved on to Minto uh, Developments um, on their community side, building uh, high-rise and low-rise, and I uh, worked there for a number of years, and now I've jumped over to a company called Nova Ridge Development, where we do both commercial mixed-use development and residential mixed-use, and I'm on the project management side, uh, so implementing the, uh, implementing the projects, uh, taking them kind of from acquisition uh, all the way through delivery of the final, uh, the final product. Nice, nice. Um, so how have things changed, I guess, for you on an individual level, like you're, just your office life? I mean, obviously, a lot of us are working from home right now. And, uh, and then, I guess, also on the sort of macro environment, how have you seen things change um, within the real estate space as a result of this, this health crisis that we're facing? Um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, our, the entire portion of our business that involves us being out on site or being with meetings, being in meetings with specialists right. has completely evaporated. Yeah. And I think that makes a huge impact on business lines that are more consumer facing so it was really interesting hearing you talk with Ryan uh, Bobic yeah. in your previous discussion with, uh, you know, I recommend anyone to go back and listen to because it did a really good job of, of the overview of kind of the, the sentiments in uh, both uh, the user and the um, owner side. Uh, yeah. Everybody's kind of navigating. Uh, but for, for a business line like that, they're much more in front of the con consumer. For sure. We're a bit more back office. We're dealing with the plan, the design, and so from that perspective, um, my days can continue shifting everything online. And so, and everyone runs their development projects differently, but it is fairly common to have, you know, at least, you know, bi-weekly or monthly large meetings where all your architects, all your engineers are in a room together dealing with whatever uh, challenges need to be addressed at that given point in the development. Right. None of that can occur in person. And it's all shifted now to being Zoom calls and uh, and uh, go to meetings, kind of uh, that that style of work. Um, and I'm not. I actually think it's it's probably going to be more productive doing that. Really? Uh, because 
there's always an advantage that comes with the face-to-face -face contact, especially when you're trying to tease out solving an engineering or an architecture problem. But ultimately, there's a huge amount of inefficiencies that come with trying to get four or five different engineering firms to show up at the same time, at the same day, from all different, you know, coming from different parts of the city. Remember, a developer, every time you have one of those meetings, is being invoiced for all of that time. Right. And that's just the time to, to get there, to park, the, yeah. the reimbursements for the parking. And so by removing all of that, I do wonder if it will increase a little bit of the efficiency that comes in the design process. And you might start to see uh, more projects being run in a digital environment. That's really interesting insight. I, I never even thought about that. I, I've, I've interacted with a lot of people on the construction side and it who have said, I mean, just naturally, like you're going to see some declines in productivity as a result of fewer guys on site, the one per suite rules, et cetera. And, and I've heard like, you know, guys are down 50 to 60% in, in their production on high rise sites right now. Um, but I guess the, the, on the soft side and the design side, I, I didn't really anticipate, I, I just would have thought that it's such a collaborative process that, you need that face to face. You need all the fingers pointing at the drawings and et cetera. But it's really, really interesting. Um, do you do you think that we're going to see more change? Like this seems to have been a catalyst for things like you just described, where we're finally convincing the old boys to leverage technology and see the value in it because they're forced into it. Does that seem like that could create lasting change, and, and maybe and maybe create further change? Yeah, it'll, it'll be a step change. I think and it'll, it'll, it will uh, ripple down throughout the development uh, process. Yeah. And at those kind of, uh, as you allude to the soft, uh, the soft parts of design, a lot more of that will move to online. Uh, developments are so specific, you know, so project specific and so specific to the point at which they're at in their life cycle yeah uh, you know for example the the gentleman you were talking to the other day from from construction um you know those are projects that have gone into that construction stage and are actually having um concrete being poured and and um those have a very different set of challenges than projects that are in the design stage yeah and it's going to be really interesting to see how especially the large developers uh who have multiple projects at multiple different stages yeah how they adapt to that challenge versus yeah. you know smaller developers for example and i'm i'm in a really small intimate team at the the shop that i'm at yeah which uh means that we we and, and just where the, the stages that our projects are at um we're a bit better positioned to continue moving forward with design development and permitting without having to put the brakes on on a project that some of the big developers with big construction sites are having to do. Construction sites have had to be shut down. Would you say that that's like, and this is one of those questions where I'll, I'll throw in that disclaimer that, you know, obviously we're not experts in this fashion, but because you worked, uh, you know, with, with a large group in, at Minto, um, do you think that that creates a degree of vulnerability for larger groups that don't have the agility like a company like yours would because of that that small team factor? Or do, are they well capitalized enough and they have enough manpower that they can kind of just, you know, steer the big cruise ship uh, to, to navigate through this this time? Um, I think optimistically, it's hopefully more of the latter. Right. Part of that is is that development is stretches over so many years yeah and a lot of the big developers that are in play right now you know at least either came out of the ashes of of you know 19 you know the the, the collapse in the 90s and the early 2000s yeah so they've weathered and they weathered 2008 and so um they're able to take a longer time perspective yeah the banks are able to you're willing to work with them on that and so um i'm hoping it's a bit more so of the latter but with that said, companies that have huge overhead burdens, uh, large real estate, pro uh, large office space profiles that they're paying rent on to sit empty right now, uh, lots of admin staff, um, those, they will have challenges because their business models require a constant, um, 
a, a constant source of new business. So you need new land coming into your business to keep, you know, the, the employees that are focused at the acquisitions and the start of the development process need to stay busy yeah. as do the people that are constructing on your construction teams. And so uh, there will be, you know, the Mattamies, the, the um, uh, Mintos, any of the big firms will be dealing with those challenges, but I also think they're well prepared to be dealing with those challenges. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, on that note, uh, actually, you had mentioned sort of the life cycle of these projects. I'm curious as to your perspective, and I'll, and I'll throw in that disclaimer again, obviously, that we're, we're not economists, and, and it's really difficult for us to accurately forecast the, the economic challenges here. But do you think that that long life cycle could almost create a bit of a hedge against, like, I don't know if we're going to see a massively declining price environment, but it does seem to allude to the reality that a correction could happen. Um, it is, is that, is the long life cycle of a development like this a risk or is it an opportunity here or, or, or a hedge that, you know, prices could recover by the time you have to close. And so you, you're not going to have to worry about people not showing up on closing day. I think it's a bit of a hedge. Yeah. Um, and there's an advantage to it. Uh, and that may have been different back in 2008, because 2008 was such a structural uh, kneecapping right. in that, you know, liquidity just completely dried up. And so suddenly people's loans were being called in and um, there was no financing for buyers. Uh, everybody was re reassessing their portfolios and not knowing what, you know, what cash flow they would have to protect themselves. Yeah. And that's the, you know, the, the great book, um, A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, which outlined kind of the plots of Lehman and how it triggered everything. Um, and, and kind of the failure of the political leadership to keep Lehman standing, because it really was, you know, the, the, the collapse of Lehman in September of 2008, which was right when we were starting school, yeah. it, um, it caused a massive liquidity crisis, which meant that nobody could react properly. In this crisis right now, the Fed's turned on the taps right away. Yeah. And all the banks seem to have a willingness to work with their various partners to get through the worst of this. And so um, I'm optimistically, again, optimistically uh, cautious that we're in a better position than we were in 2008 to survive, uh, to survive this. And the long life cycles of the projects will work to that advantage. Interesting. It's funny. I've heard a lot of bearishness associated with, you know, the Canadian credit scenario and how, uh, you know, it looked alarmingly like 08 and, and the U S seems to have, have gotten it together and been a little bit more responsible with their household debt, uh, since then. And, and we have done the opposite, but I, I think the reality is that, you know, the way the financial industry and in, and the system in Canada is structured in being so oligopolistic, um, it makes it like so that really our entire economy hedges on basically six institutions. And it, it makes it easier to deliver that liquidity into the market because there's fewer institutions um, that are the channels for it. But also it makes it easier to regulate. Like I, I think CMHC had already bought uh, 1.5 billion in, in insured loans from the banks just to help them. So, cause if, if the banks have to start taking back property, which they don't want to like, well, I guess the reality is they, ju they don't want to do that because it, it, it screws up their liquidity ratios. They Nobody wins. Nobody wins. Right. And, and, and so I, I actually don't see that happening as much as a lot of people are forecasting mass power of sales. I mean, it, I think that if we, if our banks started to struggle, it, it creates way too much opportunity to, for a lot of foreign capital to enter the market and start really having a more meaningful impact in, in Canadian finance. Um, and I don't think that that's something that, that we want to see happen. Um, do you, uh, do you think that the, the, like on the development financing side, there's the, obviously the capital costs of a, of a project that's running at, let's say, let's use 50% for simplicity's sake. If it's running at 50% and you gotta, you gotta meet your draw schedule and you're paying interest. Uh, I mean, that's going to create a, a bit of a drag on, on your pro forma and, and ultimately your return. Like, do you think that developers ultimately are going to be the ones that absorb that, that uh, burden or do you think banks are going to play a bit of a role? Does it seem to be everybody's trying to collaborate and split the, you know, I, I guess the suffering. 
Yeah, um, that's definitely a hard question. And um, it, it speaks back to a topic you alluded to before when you look at deposit schedules and how deposits start coming in, because ultimately a project will be in a lot of trouble if it misses a few different deposit points. Yeah. And usually, you know, most projects tend to be on, on uh, you know, X percentage at 30 days and 90 days, 180, you know, so they, they structure them into kind of four or five deposits over the first year to two years of a project's construction cycle. And those are really important to come in in order to trigger certain draws on your construction financing. Yeah. So if, if, if banks aren't willing to work with developers to accommodate interruptions in those deposit schedules, you could see a lot of problems start to emerge. Right. So I think, you know, and, and if you think about it now, we've probably, you know, we've probably gone through one deposit cycle since all of this really, you know, since March really, you know, things really hit in the fan. And again, every project's different depending on this, you know, when it launched and all that. But, um, you know, there's probably been one cycle of deposits that have either had to be, you know, missed or not collected in full or um, uh, adjusted in some way. And I think the banks and the developers and the consumers are all working together to solve those problems. And it's kind of, you know, every, every fish needs to, uh, you know, as you go up the food chain, everybody needs to try to absorb just a bigger part of that impact to make the whole ecosystem survive the, the, the punch. Yeah. The question will be if that continues to happen at the, you know, the next deposit cycle and the deposit cycle after that, how, how long can, can people go on absorbing those? until somebody until something breaks uh and so so hopefully if things can get you know restarted quickly and people's incomes don't start seeming you know start seeming a bit more secure then people can continue to meet their deposit cycles on the project that won't be delivered for two years from now anyways and so i think it's 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 going to really come back to how fast things open back up and how confident um buyers feel with their with their income but some people who who have deposits you know have bought places and are on their you know second or third deposit um the problem is that maybe that one person in their household lost their job and so now they have only one income to support their families and to continue making these deposits that they could you know they could well make when they had two incomes but now they're down to one income right if they're confident that that family member will get a job in the future coming out of this and will then start bringing in more income again. That um, you know, I can. I think we can get through this. Uh, but it, so it will really depend on the reopening and consumer confidence, or maybe not consumer confidence, but um, uh, personal confidence in your income stability. Right. Yeah. I, I think that that's. I, I think consumer confidence might even be the right terminology. I guess my fear that it creates a bit of a like. I guess the question is, at what point does this become systemic? Because like, there's enough projects on the go that, you know, you could create stress on even a deposit insurer as an example. Um, the, and knowing that, you know, a good portion of the absorption in condos right now is investors and, and, you know, they're really part of the church of the almighty dollar at a, at a certain point there might, if we don't continue to see growth in value, because, you know, keeping in mind a lot, like, cause these are long cycles, a lot of people are buying, with spec priced in at, you know, 20 to 30% above market value, maybe that's a stretch, but at some portion above um, market value. And I guess at that point, that's where it comes into, into play that there is an advantage for the project taking longer, but at what point are we at risk of, and this might not be a question that you're able to answer. So if it's not, just let me know, but at what point do you feel that, that we might be at risk of, owner or purchasers basically saying, okay, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to lose my deposit because my unit's not going to fulfill its value by the time I close. Like, do you think that we're going to see scenarios in which people will walk away from deals? Um, you know, if you're, if you're buying a $500,000 unit and you have $50,000 of deposit money in there, which really is actually your, 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 your equity, um, that underlying fundamental value of your property has to take at least a 10% hit for you to be then mm. you know, willing to walk away from your investment. Yeah. I don't know if prices are going to take that hit. I hope not. I'm biased though for the, you know, the industry I'm in. Yeah. Um, but 
ultimately, I, I'm a believer that the new homes market, um, the pricing is really dependent ultimately on the land market. And so until you see land suddenly start dropping in pricing, you're not going to be able to see pricing on new construction coming down. Right. Therefore, there isn't necessarily that feedback into the loop into the market where new product is now coming online at you know deflated prices, which is undercutting everybody else, which kind of drives a race to the bottom. And so I, I, I again come back to my opti optimistic, uh, optimistically cautious that that as long as land markets don't start seriously dropping in pricing. We'll, we will stabilize and then continue the growth. And we were in an insane market before. Like, you know, 2020 was starting to um, shape up to be another, you know, 2017, where, you know, just insane pricing, you know, January and February had sales, you know, incredibly high volume of new home sales. Uh, and so if anything, this is just putting a break on that and, and maybe things will settle down to a bit more of a normal. Yeah, I think could honestly be good for the market. I think that's healthy, and I do think we can see a bit of a correction. And honestly, if you're getting into multiple offers in the middle of a, a, a you know a health crisis, um, you're you're assuming a degree of risk. And I think some people are going to get burned, but I think that that's that's okay, right? That, like, um, on the design side, do you are there any changes to? I've noticed in the commercial space, you know, there's there's thought processes alluding to you know how we're going to need to integrate social distancing in, in our daily lives in the future. So, you know, getting rid of these brand new uh, open concept uh, co-working office concepts that a lot of companies have moved to where, you know, you don't even have an assigned seat and going back to your cubicle with like, you know, some sort of shield so you don't can't cough on your neighbor or whatever. Um, do you, do you think we're going to see similar changes? I don't like on the, on the residential development side, on the commercial development side, as as space adapts to this this anything like co uh, another covid uh being a threat in the market and and like are there any change meaningful changes that you're seeing there or not yet is it kind of like your your two mid cycle to determine uh i think it's a, a really interesting question maybe that's the million dollar question right. um, because what you're trying to do ultimately is predict what's going to be the more attractive product to sell going forward yeah um, where i think it will and I'm very much more focused on the uh, mid and high rise side of residential development as opposed to the low rise side, which I, I was a bit more involved with back at Minto. And so, you know, just I, I'm just putting that out as a, as a cautionary that I'm, I'm focused a bit more on, on high rise. You might see product differences really start to um, get premium. So, for example, the, the high rise versus the low rise product spread, the pricing that you'd get in the GTA for a uh, single detached versus for a condo unit. Yeah. That was, I think, you know, back in 2008 or, or around there was that, you know, a historically high discrepancy. So, you know, you're talking like four or five, six hundred thousand dollar difference between the average prices. Yeah. Um, as of the end of 2019, that had compressed to being about 150,000. Like yeah. it, it had just dramatically uh, reduced uh, just because there's no homes. And so the pricing of, of condos was going up quite dramatically. Um, will you start to see that spread open up a little bit as people say, hey, look, you know what? I want my backyard. I want that. I'm willing to go out into further into the GTA. Um, and that might drive faster appreciation of low rise housing um, versus maybe condos. And so maybe that spread will start to open up a bit. bit. And then another way to think about it with within product, with you're looking specifically at a high rise or a mid rise, is um, your studios and your small one bedrooms. And so, um, as the market, uh, you know, as as fundamental economics kept driving those units smaller and smaller because build costs are really high, land costs are really high, and consumers can only afford so much space, especially on the maintenance side. You know, your condo fees. Um, we were starting to reach into the you know 300 to 400 square foot territory for your entry product studios uh, or really small one bedrooms um but what started to happen in kind of 2017 2018 is that the various financial institutions stopped looking at that product and said hold on we don't want to hold that in our portfolios and therefore it became a lot harder for purchasers to finance that type of product. So if you were buying a 325 square foot studio, you actually might have had to do that in cash 
uh, or have a whole bunch of, of conditions on your financing. Uh, and, and some institutions wouldn't even look at that type of product. Yeah, yeah CMHC think, won't insure anything below, I think, 500 square feet, right? So those, um, those type of trends honestly might continue uh, so we might not see 325 square foot studios anymore right. because of because of that and because this whole thing you know who wants to live in that shoebox if you know a crisis like this happens again. Yeah, I, th I also think like the investment demand. Sorry to interrupt you there, but um, yeah. the investment demand as well, right? Because like a lot of those made it made their way into the the rent long term rental and short term rental market as well, right? And now that that's tightening as a result of obviously nobody using ghost hotels, but also the regulatory environment in Toronto. Um, you know, that, that could change the absorption of a unit like that as well. Um, it's an interesting topic and I, you know, I, I maybe we flagged this for, for, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to revisit the topic yeah. of who the actual buyers are in the new homes market because, yeah. you know, the classic story is the investor versus the end user. Yeah. And that is, uh, you know, it's actually an interesting, um, what appears to be happening right now is that the, all the end users have dried up or they've stopped. They right. put a hold on everything. But the investor market is actually still there at right. this point. People are seeing good opportunity to get a few extra incentives. They understand real estate cycles. They understand that, look, you're buying something for three to five years down the road, not for, you know, flipping tomorrow. Yeah. And so um, the investor market is actually, uh, from everything I'm hearing, it's actually stayed relatively uh, intact, which is probably what's supporting all sales going on at the moment in the new sure. homes industry. Yeah. And so, um, you know, people like to demonize investors, but they, uh, they're probably what is keeping a lot of builders who are moving any given product right now. That's, that's going to investors. Yeah. I think it's funny. Everybody does want to demonize the investors, but ultimately they're the ones responsible for the, all the equity that you have in your house. So, um, <laughs> I, I want to be mindful of your time. So, um, do you, is there anything you want to add that, that you feel we didn't discuss or any advice that you want to give to people on, on how you're dealing with or, this or, or how you, um, how you, how you can recommend that others do? I think for whatever it's worth, um, the, the, the new homes market, uh, especially in Toronto and the GTA, but also across the country, uh, is incredibly reliant on big launch parties. So getting large groups of brokers into a room together and having them, uh, ultimately you know, make sales and that whole business model has has been shut down completely yeah you can't hold big vip parties you can't get multiple broker showings going on at once in your sales centers and you know people put a lot of money into their sales centers um and part of i think the industry worked in that way as a legacy of not having technology in the 90s and 2000s that really supported any alternative mm -hmm. so i'm really curious to see coming out of this now that we do have that technology uh you know zoom meetings um digital signing digital signing is only taken off in the past you know 12 24 months right really here in toronto For sure. and so um it will be really interesting to see how the industry emerges and i, I do predict that it will move a lot more towards uh digital environments and less towards this broker oriented uh mass events that's not to say like the brokers are still going to be the key component of selling new uh yeah. pre-construction homes but uh how you how you connect with that broker from a vendor's perspective is going to be completely different i think because we can't, we, like, even you know, people are going to want to start launching a project in the coming months and they will not be able to host a hundred brokers in a room together. Um, I don't foresee that coming back until 2021 maybe. Yeah, no, I think you're right in that respect. That's a, a really interesting insight. And I'm, I'm very curious to see, because when I was talking to Big Ben, he mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of launches still planning on happening. Um, I mean, the show's got to go on, right? Like you're saying, like a lot of these companies still just got to keep the, the, the bottom line, right? Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how that takes shape. And I think that, that that's really interesting insight on how the real estate industry could ultimately, uh, you know, finally move from the archaic uh, space that it was, um, which we're already seeing um, changing. Anyway, I, I, want, I want to let you go because I know you got a, a call coming up and you got to prepare. Um, so is, yeah, if there's any, anything else you want to add, you're welcome to. But um, where can people reach out to you if, if they want to get in touch? 
they can uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, which is a great place, Brett Llewellyn Thomas, um, or you can send me an email at uh, blthomas at novaridge.com. Uh, it's blthomas at novaridge.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I wish, could, uh, I wish we could uh, catch up a little more, but maybe we'll get on a call later today. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate it, man. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you're doing well. And the insight was great. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from it. You as well. Great chatting, Daniel. Thanks, buddy. Take, Take care. care of yourself.